Good morning. Uh, my name is Brian Pulaski, CTO at DriveScale. I've been introduced. I, um, as you heard, I spent uh, 21 years at NetApp. And um, one of the reasons I came to DriveScale, uh, going to the question about aren't you a storage company, was because um, I really wanted to work on like 21st century technologies, you know, kind of scale out apps, no SQL databases, all these things that are kind of kind of new and wonderful in the world and it's adding a lot of business value to companies. So I actually put the storage industry behind me um, because that's kind of like that's kind of old school stuff, the enterprise stuff. Which camera is facing me, by the way, that one? <laughs> is, is it that one? So uh, George, just joking, keep up the work at NetApp. You're doing a great job and I'll see you soon. Okay, <laughs> so on to the product architect. I have some setup slides. Everything I say, Take it with a grain of salt. Okay, I have some uh, setup slides. I'm not going to repeat um, what uh, Gene covered quite a bit of. I, I'll, I'm going to reference it right before I go into the architecture um, discussion. I, I want to set up the case a little bit and touch on a couple of points that he brought up as the case for composable infrastructure. Why? Why should you care? Um, so. There's a class of applications that have emerged due to a set of trends in the industry that 15 years ago you weren't going to do. Um, distributed massively parallel compute. When they hit a clock rate in 2004, the limit, and they went from uniprocess to multiprocessors, and that everything started going parallel within the computer, and then the hyperscalers went parallel outside the computer to handle now billions of transactions, uh, millions, now billions of users, um, distributed massively parallel compute became the norm for a large set of critical applications. Um, unbounded streams of data in real time. Uh, the, you know, when I was in the storage company, the data, the data deluge, it's always happening. The lines always, from your perspective, went this way and up. Um, and it was all really interesting from the storage industry perspective because we were selling stuff to store it. Um, we weren't asking a lot of questions of what people were doing with it. And at DriveScale, I'm closer to the applications that are attempting to actually make intelligent use of all of that data. But it's only gotten worse. In fact, I think what people are finding, and I think uh, what Gene was covering, is that the trick here to analytics is that the more data you have, the more intelligence you can derive from it. The more sources of data you have, the more connections you could make that add greater value. Um, so we've all become essentially um, hoarders and pack rats in the IT department. Um, unstructured data at massive scale. The data that is being analyzed is coming from multiple sources in their native format. Uh, you know, I used to draw these pictures for unstructured versus structured data. Unstructured data was files and files and your things in there, whatever, your mail messages. Structured data was these really kind of expensive, well-run apps called you know, Oracle Database and things like that. Basically, data is coming in in multiple formats, sometimes structured, semi-structured, but all of it is coming from different feeds and being fed in at different rates into the analysis apps. Ten years ago, the world was simple. You deployed Hadoop. Is there any question? I'm sorry, right? This is what you did, right? This is, it came out of Google, it had to be good, right? Or <laughs> Yahoo spun out Hortonworks 10 years ago, whatever, right? And you ran that and you had big data an analytics and the world was good and you knew everything you had to do about your business. So you saw the logo slide that Gene put up with all of the applications that are now being used to process different types of data in different ways to actually run in parallel or in pipelines to produce business intelligence. Those applications are all being deployed underneath a single web scale application for any particular customer. Um, so the cooperation and pipeline in parallel is key. There is no simple answer anymore. You don't have to know Hadoop seriously. You have to know seven apps, probably minimum, to be a area expert in IT for big data deployment and best practices. So the new modern data intensive apps stresses the underlying infrastructure IT operations in new ways. Um, but very interestingly, they tended to agree on one thing. They agreed on Ethernet 
as providing the commodity fabric, these applications are not running on fiber channel sense. We all agree on that? Yep. Heads not up and down? Yes. Okay. Um, they fiber channel SAN, good for what it does, but was never good at scale. Ethernet and NFS, which I know and love, um, was the scaling architecture for data sharing. Um, this goes beyond what even NFS does comfortably. Commodity components, um, the applications are different. So this isn't, this isn't a fragile app running on a highly designed 7.9 HA configuration. These are robust apps running over commodity hardware. Actually, I'm trying to do some calculations on what the failure rates and how often you are in degraded mode in a 1,000 node Hadoop cluster because it's probably more common than not. The apps are designed to run in that environment. Very different design center. Performance comes from scale out, not from scale up. So, um, software defined. Everything's software defined. Run commodity hardware, software stacks, up and down, left and right. And um, yeah, it's just scale out. Any questions? <laughs> I can calm down if you want. <laughs> um, technology trends, I kind of touched on this already. The things that are enabling this is, you have to understand, 15 years ago, wasn't happening. Things were changing, but not yet there. And, and I, 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 as, as industry people, did you, always, did you ever say occasionally 15 years ago that Ethernet is, the, Ethernet is the fabric of choice, it's the future? Oh yeah. And then five years later you kind of said, Ethernet's the fabric of choice, it's the future, right? So I th actually think we might be getting close. <laughs> <laughs> when I deployed 10 gigabit Ethernet in my home three months ago, for my own personal use, I decided that maybe Ethernet has finally gotten to the point where <laughs> high-performance fabrics are ubiquitous. Um, and, and, then, and, so, and what did my, one of my waggy friends say to me on Facebook? Like, why are you deploying 10 gigabit Ethernet? Why don't you just wait for the 5 and 10 gigabit Wi-Fi coming out? And I'm like, well, because I really have a problem to solve now. Thank you very much. But this is where we are. Ubiquitous, high-performance fabrics. Massively parallel data, no SQL applications. Commonplace. Um, Again, not the scale up, all scale out. Rise of solid state storage. So uh, I liked, <laughs> liked that thing Tom showed, thing. Um, by the way, 2000, anybody see the kind of retro thing today? 2000 was the introduction of the USB thumb drive, the first intro. I saw this historical reference pop up in my feed this morning. I really got to change my Google News settings kind of stuff to kind of damp that stuff out. But flash storage is relatively new, but it's only recently that flash storage is becoming ubiquitous and affordable. Even then, you know, Tom made the point of it's you know, now not quite 10 times as much as disk, but it's still a little bit expensive, so that kind of makes things a little bit tricky when you're planning, such that when we talk about composable infrastructure to people and people were over-provisioning spinning disk, I mean, what's six spinning drives between friends. If you just don't, if you don't know if it's six or 12, just make it 12, disks are cheap. Okay, if you're making a provisioning decision on a solid state deployment, six additional SSDs over six SSDs in a captured DAS environment becomes a little bit more of a higher line item on your IT budget today. Now that will change over time, but right now, I think one of the things that's gonna get a lot more interested in composable infrastructure and controlling costs is that solid state applications are on the rise, they're great for real-time database deployments, and transactional processing at real-time with customers, fraud detection real-time, right? I, I recently came to the conclusion, watching a presentation from PayPal, that it's not, it's not detecting fraudulent transactions that they're trying to solve. That is not the problem they're trying to solve. What they're trying to solve is approving all the transactions quickly so that you don't use another form of payment. If they take too long to get back with an approval, you're going to whip out your credit card and skip PayPal, right? So fraudulent processing has nothing to do with fraud. It's everything about approval. And that's all big data, all real time now. A lot of this is going towards SSD-based scale out, massively scale out, no SQL databases. Um, the reincarnation of RDMA. NetApp did a lot of work. 
in the early days. Does anybody, can anybody raise their hand and say DAFs and RDMA and you got, you got that stuff? Yeah. So I have a history here. <laughs> However, I will say that the emergence of NVMe over TCP, the NVMe over fabric solutions today, and the standardization and the industry support behind it far, it, it's, it's, it's like the Maverick waves in, you know, the, the RDMA stuff in the early 2000s was like la waves lapping on a, the shore of the Mediterranean. This is more like a Maverick wave coming off a, if you guys are into sur surfing, all surfers here, Santa Cruz, Maverick waves. Anyway, it's a big wave coming and basically, again, the commoditization of RDMA. Um, let me just go forward on this because I want to say one thing. Gene covered a lot of this. Let's leave it this. So the challenging, time-consuming way that you plan capacity conf configurations. I want to use, I, I think the next slide has this, but understand that most of these applications today are being deployed in captured DAS configurations, storage and compute together. The configuration decision is made at purchase time. That is when you decide what you deploy. And this is where the OBR for provisioning occurs. Two factors play into this. No ISV for these applications wants to have support cases coming up. So they're going to err on the side of conservative deployment of the amount of storage to CPU. No customer wants to underguess this because they're racking up equipment, they fill their racks up, they lay this out beautifully, cable it all up, and find off, found out that they're short on disk space, but they just hit the limit within their skins. They have to allocate more rack space. A any of you have toured modern data centers and saw all those empty racks available in the real estate that is so expensive in some places? So this purchase decision definition of the reference architectures for the apps is painful. Then factor that in with that, with the problem that each application has a completely different reference architecture. So you are gonna make a bunch of decisions about fixed architectures and purchase decision, spend weeks deploying it, and hopefully not be wrong. Um, Again, since they're different reference architectures, you can't really redeploy. If you, got, if you guess like, well, I didn't need 100 nodes for my Cassandra database deployment, I only needed 60, let me use these 40 nodes that are ill-suited for the other applications I just deployed. Um, your compute node dies. Capture DAS. Compute node dies, your storage just went away. That's how it works. And replacing the compute node involves replacing the storage node and degraded application performance while you're doing this. Um, and then Gene touched on some of this other stuff. So we're looking at composable infrastructure as a new deployment model for data intensive computing. <sighs> Let me build this out a second. Uh, Gene talked about these two use cases. This is AppNexus the captive fixed DAS, purchase decisions, going away towards composable infrastructure. This, to me, in my discussions with prospects and our current customers, is the common place that people are coming from because it's the reference architecture for a lot of the web scale applications. The cloud infrastructure was the clear sense use case where they basically found themselves having to go to fixed it, uh, sorry, he's called, <laughs> what do you call it? Dedicated instances with lots of I.O. going in and out and getting charged on the I.O. for a web scale application. Pulling it out, save the money. But this is the captive one is, I think, the, by far the more common use case of where we're gaining traction in the, in the discussions with prospects and customers. And this leads me to what do we do? So instead of purchase time, configuration decisions making, um, how much disk, what kind of media, SSD versus spinning disk, to uh, compute nodes, tight, caught in skins, go to a disaggregation operation where you buy thin clients, maybe you have a boot disk, high speed fabric, ubiquitous, and your storage resources collected into pools 
for deployment when you want to create a virtual, cu virtual cluster. So instead of doing the orders, waiting for the right reference to come in, and then deploying it for the particular application, buy some cookie cutter nodes, some storage, and then mix and match on a per application basis based on the reference architecture. And better yet, if you're wrong, then rebalance. Um, this is a quick build of, the, um, of what composable infrastructure looks like at a very high level, and then I'll go into the architecture. When you first deploy drive scale, you have pools of compute, pools of storage, flash and disk, and the manager waiting to create clusters. This is the physical set of assets you have to manage. You can run a number of applications on it. Gene talked about some of them. When you start creating clusters, you create logical groupings in a secure fashion using cryptographic methods to create application, I call it application multi-tenancy. Some people are arguing with me, but they're secure tenants within a shared infrastructure. So you go over and deploy Hadoop with some computers and a certain amount of disk. Somebody comes along and wants to deploy Cassandra running over spinning disk. That's the way they're deploying it. The performance is fine for them. And then the same customer wants to deploy Aerospike, which is absolutely specified to run over SSDs. It is a high performance, millions of transactions per second scale out database. You deploy this using the same tools and the same infrastructure components creating secure clusters that are managed in the large at scale. And that's what we are looking at. And I'll talk a little bit about scale, I think the next slide. I think, can I just jump in? There's one Please. missing piece on here, and that is how are you orchestrating the network side of things? Um, or have you got a slide later? I have a slide that talks about it. Can I, can I, because that's an important part. Yes. <laughs> um, it's an important part because, yeah, it's an important part. I'll get <laughs> we'll get to it. Okay. 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 So, um, you're not supposed to say this, right? This, the slide build is wrong. <laughs> so, compo ah, this whole thing is wrong. Okay, Jesus. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, I think, oh, no, it's, it's got lost in translation. So, composable infrastructure to some people is 10 nodes and 100 disks in basically doing blade configuration with compute blades and compute nodes. So th this is composable infrastructure. It is, okay? The difference is composable infrastructure at scale. The applications we're talking about are minimum 40, 50 nodes for the SSD-based scale-out databases that are, also, that are spec to go to 500 nodes. Hadoop nodes going to starting at 100? For a small inst installation, easily 500 going past 1,000. And now take the collection of them and the applications being run, and we are in proof of concepts at a 10,000 node deployment in the data center with 100,000 disks. So we are testing, the testing we did before when we started was at 3,000 nodes and 100,000 disks. This is our design point here. This is the scale we need to operate at. This is not chassis management for a, um, a blade deployment. This is at scale deployment for these scale out applications. Um, and the, uh, just a mention, because somebody asked this question the other day, the composer server, which is three replicas, um, the management platform, is, is a modest requirement at, this is what we measured at the 3,000 nodes at 100,000 disks was 128 gig RAM, an SSD, and a dual socket machine. Uh, this, is like, this is like so commonplace. This is what's being retired in data centers today for in the, in the managed part of the data center. Architecture. Okay. Any questions after? That was just a lead into this. Okay. Um, I will <laughs> go back and forth between, between saying composer as the user interface, which you'll see a demo after I'm finished. That's, where we're, that's why I'm going really fast. Composer as the GUI for management, but the composer is also the platform 
that is the management platform and that basically ties together everything in a database and provides reliable um, and durable uh, configuration, information, and management. So, the key part of the DriveScale composable platform is the composer itself. If you were doing a POC, the first thing you would see on installing our software is the composer. And this is where you create virtual clusters from available pools of resources. This is the platform. The GUI is what presents the platform to the user, goes through a set of RESTful APIs. There are two parts of the system, and I'm getting to your question. There are two parts of the system where we install user-level agents to manage the resource pools. Server agents in user space running on the Linux compute pools. These are probably being deployed with how you deploy your Linux, your Linux versions. You're deploying an RPM on top to install a server agent. Server agent pops up, reaches out to the composer, and starts feeding back the inventory. The number of cores, amount of memory, and any interesting bits about that server that you want to know. Not much about disk because you have a boot disk at most. The adapter agents are the ones that do the inventory of the HDD and SSD pools, again, communicating back, communicating back to the composer to set the initial state of what your available resource pools for allocating for clusters. I'm going to get to your question. <laughs> no, no, I just didn't remember the order. Um, one important thing is that I mentioned that you're going to be deploying probably the, the agents using your stand, what you're using your data center for deploying Linux-based applications and Linux-based extensions. We are not trying to replace that stuff. So our API that we use for the GUI is also used today by some of our customers in third-party orchestration applications or just management in their data center for doing some of the deployments and refreshes on Linux upgrades and things like that. We, we're not going to manage that. Um, we don't want to manage that. Um, and going on and if, later on in the slide deck, we're integrating into things like Kubernetes for container management. We're not trying to come up with a container management solution. But the problem we're solving is the physical infrastructure and managing the disaggregated compute and storage. That is not being done by the container managers and all this other stuff. Okay? So, now we get to you. <laughs> there it is. So, Missing piece. the composer keeps a database that has all of the available resources in terms of compute, server nodes, and the hard disks and SSDs, and their locations. As part of the communication of the agents back to the composer, it also communicates the network topology back into the composer. This is not presented to the user. And this is the thing I want to, this is why I wanted to put this off a little bit. What's presented to the user and the composer are the things they need to worry about and to manage. The networking, we worry about. What we worry about is that you're basically doing web scale applications that have a very well-defined, typically triple replica, wanting rack failure semantics. They want the replicas to be in different failure zones, and that's how the application is designed to work. So we, do, we worry about that for you. We basically are assuming that you have a top of rack switch, the compute is talking to the storage, we make sure that the connections between when we set up the clusters and do all the magic for you so you don't have to worry about it, make sure that we're doing shortest path, highest performance, and not coupling racks that would screw up the recovery semantics of a lot of these web scale apps. All that said, you can override stuff in templates and customize how you deploy your software. But our basic approach is to essentially follow the semantics of web, web scale applications as we've understood them. So the basic rule is we do everything we can to make sure you don't shoot yourself in the foot until you take the safety off and really want to do it yourself. Yes, yes, uh, Eric, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're, we're <laughs> so actually, that's, the way you said it is good because we're doing everything you can to make sure you don't shoot yourself in the foot. 
understand that this technology is still rolling out to people who have never seen some of these applications before. And they're working with their ISB partners, and those ISB partners are defining reference architectures and best practices for laying out. And by the way, we have some documents on our website on reference architectures that make for excellent airplane reading. <laughs> um, so, so just download them before you get on the airplane or pay for that Wi-Fi <laughs> for the flight. Um, that um, it's about the best practices and how the racks and connections are laid out and then how that works with DriveScale. But yes, our goal is to make sure that people or applications are not going to fail unexpectedly. Okay. This is commodity components, right? This is the, so what we want them to do is we want to, we want the we want the, the applications to fail expectedly, right? This is not unexpectedly. Okay? We don't want to introduce new failure modes. That's right. um, Cloud Central. I'm really not going to spend much time on this. This is our um, if you're aware of uh, Pure Storage. Pure One Cloud Assist. This is our, um, our uh, AWS-based AWS -based, um, support portal. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about it, but that's um, kind of that's what everybody does these days. Um, what we are spending a bit of time in there, and I'll explain what we're investing in. So the composer, our primary orchestrator, the platform, is a critical component to managing your logical clusters and your pools of resources. I want to spend a little time on describing where we spent our time. So it needs to be highly available. We're essentially saying disaggregate all of your compute, captured compute and storage, put it out into resource pools of the network, and host multiple applications. OK. Um, so the orchestrator provides durable resource bindings. We're leveraging highly available industry standard components, Apache Zookeeper and MongoDB, that understand how to do triple replicas. You deploy, do I say this here? OK, then put this down here. Um, you deploy three instances of our orchestration platform onto three instances of orchestration platform onto three different fault domains outside of your scale out resources. This is your standard IT infrastructure. This is the critical part, our management platform. Um, it has failure properties of loss of one node. It will continue working. Loss of all nodes, it will stop accepting new configuration changes. Very, very important, though. I'm talking about the control plane. Going back to that picture of the agents and the composer, most, let me, I'm sorry, let me go back. All this stuff is control plane, outside of the data path. Once everything is set up, compute talks through networking, through persistent connections. Well, then they can load balance and shift based on, uh, based on hardware fails, failures anywhere in the path to disk. That's the data path. The control plane exists outside of that, critical for performance, especially for NVMe. So. If this all goes away, everything keeps working. This is important for providing services at scale. Um, I was talking to a colleague when we did a dry run for this yesterday. By the way, this is me after a dry run. Um, I was talking to a colleague yesterday, and we basically do snapshots of the configuration, push it up to Cloud Central, and you can recover from a disaster. But I observed that since this is in your well-managed IT knock part, if you just lost three failure domains of a distributed orchestrator for your web scale stuff, you may have other things to worry about right now because part of your data center is crashing big time. So that said, you can recover from a complete failure of the composer with the configuration information by downloading it from Cloud Central. Um, I talked a lot about this. Composer functions, the first thing it does when given a network of nodes and disks, you install the agents. Inventory of the disaggregated resources provides creation, expansion, management, and reporting on logical clusters. These are the application-specific clusters you're deploying. The composer uses the same RESTful API as third-party orchestrators. Health monitoring and alarm notification. This is probably more important for web scale applications and for enterprise applications. 
An enterprise storage deployment with an Oracle database is highly available hardware on highly available compute that is well designed with components guaranteed to run nonstop. Web scale applications are being deployed over thin clients or, well, DAS based clients, commodity hardware in the counts of thousands. The probabilities of failure are much higher than an eight node you know, enterprise storage array running your Oracle database. You're just dealing with larger numbers. The numbers start to multiply. Okay? So health and alarm, monitoring alarm notification, important to us. Um, mm, mm, mm. Ah, storage. The key to making this all work is that when we configure disks with compute, from the perspective of the application, it looks like locally attached storage. It looks like DAS. If it didn't, bad things happen. Because all of these applications have been designed to run on bare metal hardware with captured DAS. So when we set up the storage stack, we basically simulate that. When there is file systems involved, they're local file systems. We don't do anything in the storage layer. We just vend disks or SSDs. But I'll talk about a little bit more about SSDs in a bit. Um, I talked about RackAware, but the file systems and RAID, when we talk about it, that's being done at the Linux level for the based on application requirements, which varies application to application. I'm creating a gigantic, what I'm calling the big table of web scale applications, and I'm identifying what local file system they all want to run on. It's very interesting. They, don't, they can't agree on anything, by the way. So, um, ah. simplify this problem of deploying many applications in large, part of the composer function is to allow you to create a template for each application that defines the reference architecture for a node that you just then say, I want 100 of them. This template creation is very simple. Chris will demonstrate it, so I don't want to talk about it more. Um, the other thing we do is we have role-based administration. Um, read only, modify administrator groups, and this goes up into our um, Cloud Central um, property. Um, we're not currently doing multi tenancy at a customer level, but there's a lot of stuff in the architecture that's not being exposed yet, and the capabilities are here for future availability, of, say, for service providers hosting multiple customers who want to provide. View, uh, kind of views to customers so they can look at what they're doing. Are there any questions? Yeah. So there's. Yeah. I didn't mean to raise my hand. I was told not to do that. Don't raise. Really? <laughs> it's considered polite in some circles. Yeah, it's the throwing Canadian. things. It's is, the Canadian thing. <laughs> okay. So, um, so these templates, they uh -huh. are something that you own that are proprietary that are oh, provided. No, no, no. Yeah. No. Right. Um. I. We. I've been in this, when I got here, I was, I was in discussion that we should just throw out, I think we had throw out some sample templates. Are they in there? No, okay, doesn't matter. Um, so, they're, no, they're not proprietary. You, you, but, but probably they're particular to any given deployment at a customer. I get it. So they, can, they create their own. They're not proprietary. Create your own. My only comment was that we might want to create some yeah. sample the, the templates to edit. Because you can yes. copy a template and then edit it. Exactly. Yes. So yeah. that's what I meant. Like as yeah. a reference, a starting yeah. point, a template for a template. Yes, right? yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm, I'm into, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a modern software person. Yeah. I, every, I copy everything. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not a model, though. A template is not a, not a model. A template uh -huh. defines the amount of, the, it, it's a constraint-based approach. And you'll see, you'll see it from well, Chris's demo. Yeah. Number of cores, amount of memory, and these are constraints on what, because you have a pool of resources. You're doing constant refreshes of your compute. They're all different models. You can't buy the same number of cores you had three years ago. And you do a rolling upgrade. That's what we encourage. That's what people do because nobody replaces everything. And you keep your application running because you can never shut it down. So you do rolling upgrades with newer machines. So the template model is constraint-based, minimum number of cores, minimum amount of memory, and then the disks you want, minimum capacity per disk, because the spindle count for HDDs is important for performance. Okay. So, <laughs> the agents, drive scale, compute node and adapter agents, I think I've covered most of this, node inventory, lightweight agents running user level on Linux servers, um, the adapter agent for the storage simply bridges 
the storage protocols to the Ethernet fabric. Um, important about all of this is it cryptographically ensures, well, it sets up a cryptographic connection, and particularly the adapter agent provides the security against anybody accessing the storage from outside of the cluster. Being a member of a logical cluster is a secure, a secure event. You cannot touch the data in there from outside the cluster. If a node fails, you eject the node, and then you add a node to the cluster, putting it in with the security domain for that application, and then you attach the storage to the replacement node. But it doesn't just, you just can't randomly go, hey, access that data now quick. No, you first have to add it to the cluster. The cluster is the security control over this. Da, 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 da. Monitoring. Um, the compute agent, besides doing the inventory, this is what executes the configuration specified in the template in terms of the volumes, um, sorry, in terms of the number, the disks, the file systems to deploy, and if you're using RAID. Some of the applications we're deploying on use RAID mirroring. So you can do other things, but that's, it, it acts on behalf <coughs> of the purpose of when you create a cluster. And by the way, when you create a cluster, it goes out, sets this thing up, and gives you a preview of like, this is what I'm about to do with 500 nodes. I'm gonna deploy this configuration. Does it look good to you? And you hit okay. Not that you can't just hit destroy a second later. Okay, um, again, DriveScale Cloud Central, primary customer facing support site, always on support. In AWS, you can always access it. Standard stuff. Software updates, documentation, um, go out to a POC in Europe, download, hey, what software is on that box? You know what, download the latest software from Cloud Central for the customer account and get that up and running before you do the POC. Log file captures, historical data. Um, for the future, we are looking to get more input data to allow us to do predictive analytics and trending not only for any particular customer, but across the customer base and learn more about these applications being deployed on top of us. Will you drive that down to things as low as uh, failure rates on given models of servers or things like that eventually? And, dri and drives, yeah. 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 You, you, you read the Backblaze report, right? The, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I, it's, it's like every time the Backblaze report comes up, I, it's like get a cup of coffee and start <laughs> chuckling, right? Exactly. Uh, so, so yes, we are, we are looking at collecting that amount of data on, uh, but but we don't. We need a bigger pool. Yeah, right. No, you need statistically. Yeah. Viable. But we're gonna we're gonna get there, and then oh, we want to use that to basically uh, provide better in better direction to our customers. All right. Customer says, by the way, what drives are working well? Well, well, don't use the. <laughs> okay, okay. So talking about a lot of stuff. Fabric. The default choice for storage connection from the servers to the, from the compute to the storage is iSCSI, so you can choose NVMe. And it is completely, it is cryptographically secure. And you could also enable over the wire encryption and at rest encryption, that's an option. Not everybody wants to do that, but you can. Um, with the number of cores on servers, this is becoming rather cheap. Um, this is what you need to do that as a user of the DriveScale platform. There is a path through our system called Quick Cluster where it just doesn't even ask the question of ISO does the NVMe. It just says, do you want to encrypt it or not? You hit it, it pulls out of the resource pools, set of compute and a set of the number of disks you want and presents a cluster to you. You don't pipe it. You don't go in there and set up iSCSI connections. You don't even have to know anything about iSCSI, which, by the way, working on the iSCSI standard in the early 2000s, <laughs> you don't want to spend a bunch of time on it, but you do want to use it because it is the thing that runs over Ethernet. But it's not something that appears to the user. Are you sticking with the software layer iSCSI drivers, or are you working with card vendors if they embed it in the, uh... Software layer now. Yeah, we, we do not currently use the acceleration that's right. available in, in the cards. That, we're, that's fine. We're, the software's got a lot more road features, miles and yes. tests. We are seeing, given the performance of the CPUs mm -hmm. 
and the performance tunings to Linux, and some tunings that we have done, including opening up multiple, multiple iSCSI paths from each node to the storage components, provides throughput and latency that is serving our customers today. But the disks are shared through server via iSCSI? Or, or yes. Uh, okay. iSCSI end to end, unless you specify NVMe. And then today you're doing Rocky V2. Okay. Okay, because that's what's available. We're looking forward to NVMe over TCP. We think that's going to be a simplification and a, a kind of burst open NVMe in, in the large. Um, so, it's all automated. I just talked about this. Cryptographically secure connections, all automated across the fabric and secure multi-application tenants within the pool managed by the composer manager. By the way, I should probably mention, you likely will have one composer platform per data center. That seems to be what our customers are doing now. Um, probably because you don't want to create a failure domain across a wide area. So you're going to do one composer per data center. Okay, I think I'm doing a lot here. Yes, um, compute node not available. I described all this, yeah. this is great. I'm on a roll. But I wanted to cover this slide for you. It's my total knowledge of security. <laughs> Wide keys good. Well-known security standards, good. Any questions? Okay. <laughs> it's me and security. You know I work with some really good security people. <laughs> I work with Wit at Sun. Anyway, uh, so, um, ah, okay. I want to talk a little bit about the flash adapter real quick. So, one thing that we did differently, the, the, which you, um, sorry, Ethan, you saw the old presentation, and if you guys looked at it, the drive scale adapter for Ethernet to SAS was a 1U box that just flipped stuff into JBOTs. For the NVMe case, we embedded the, the hardware into a shelf directly attached with NVMe. Why would you do anything else? And then why would you actually try to break apart NVMe outside the shelf and attach to the drive? So this is a common method, and this is what HGST did with their Serve 24HA box that we run on top of. Um, so it's high performance, instead of 10 or maybe even 25 later on for the, for the HDD DSA to SAS, 100 gig, 100 gig connectors and redundancy in the two controllers to provide high performance path to the NVMe drives. They support Rocky. If you run Rocky V2 end to end, you get a full NVMe connection from the nodes to the storage within the boxes. This is important, okay? When somebody, first of all, uh, is anybody in disagreement that NVMe is the way that all SSD drives are growing, if anybody cares? It's Any arguments world. about it? <clears throat> Except for me at home where I'm still buying the SATA drives? Because they're so cheap now, right? <laughs> so, um, but the NVMe drives probably in my future. Um, so we just basically didn't do any of the interme intermediate steps, doing fully NVMe. Everybody's into NVMe now. You see the announcements all over the place. Um, one thing we did differently than HDDs. We allow slicing of the SSDs into one gigabyte slices that can be combined to right size the SSDs per node. The SSDs have enough IOPS and bandwidth to allow that. The applications running on spinning disk in, in big data, they're doing sequential I.O. If you start aggregating and slicing HDDs, really bad things happen which is sort of an explanation why enterprise storage arrays that aggregate big data workloads actually start falling apart because they're not seeing sequential I.O. 500 nodes doing sequential I.O. to an enterprise storage array create a perfectly random workload, which is like worst case scenario for these guys, right? So, but we are slicing SSDs because the feedback we got from customers and prospects is the SSDs have gotten so big so fast, my applications don't need that much space. I am over-provisioning within the SSDs in my captured DAS. Break it out, slice it up, vend it out. Done. If you want all SSDs, you can have all SSDs too. Lots of fast lanes connecting everything. If Satya was up here, he would regale you with this diagram. 
um, and NVMe SSDs. We support iSCSI and Rocky V2. Um, my personal suspicion is that a lot of people are going to buy a, a SSD box and deploy it quickly over iSCSI. Our NICs are Rocky V2 capable, but they may not want to deploy Rocky V2 initially. However, the box is future-proofed to do Rocky V2 in the future, and of course, obviously works with NVMe over TCP. I talked all about this. Um, our performance testing is that we're seeing near-native NVMe performance over commodity Ethernet. That's, that's the walk away. That's what we're looking for, and that's what we're testing. Although I do find it scary to think that 100 gig Ethernet is considered commodity. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm going to zip like one minute through five slides because this is the demo, right? Kubernetes? The end of the demo? End of the demo. Okay. Problem of capture persistent data. So we have a plug-in to Kubernetes to allow you to basically, instead of attaching the disk to the Linux instance, attaching it to the container instance. And I can't go into a lot more detail on that except to make an observation. When Kubernetes was deployed for live images and non-persistent data, everybody was like, this is great. And then this happened. Oh, uh-oh. <laughs> By the way, it's the first words my son learned when he was <laughs> a year and a half. Uh-oh, which it never was really a good thing because uh, something <laughs> was broken, right? So when people started falling in love with Kubernetes and then saying, why can't I run my persistent data applications over Kubernetes? Right? The problem is, is that the data doesn't move. The container moves easily. The data doesn't move easily. Um, I've been told that when people move the containers over, that essentially they rely on the application mirror rebuild to rebuild the data on the target. If somebody is basically, do, or they're copying the data off the disk. This is the fundamental problem of coupling compute to storage. This is what network storage solved, dare I say it, in the early 90s, right? And this is one of the things we're trying to bring back, this, this, this separation of storage and compute to regain the operational characteristics that allow you to operate more quickly and efficiently. Um, I still said this. It was primarily stateless. They're now deploying stateful. Um, Scale out applications have stateful behavior, have stateful data, and they want to deploy it over local storage. So co enter composable infrastructure. The two standards now are Flex Volume, was the original one from Kubernetes, and CSI is now a common standard for different container managers. You can read the slides later on, because I really do want to get to the demo. But, so with DryScale. <laughs> Worked really hard on these these <laughs> animations. Here, that goes around, crosses. Ah, okay. Customer value improves performance. No data replication with physical service fail. Automatically adjust resources. Um, you know, it's just a more intelligent way to employ persistent storage in a container environment. We're getting a lot of interest in this. The persistent storage containers are a new thing. Dun, 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 dun. And by the way, um, so this would be a recap of what both Gene and I said about what we're doing. Scale to thousands of compute, tens of thousands of disk, disaggregated elements, any ratio of compute to storage, right size your deployments, and software-based infrastructure. And that is what composable infrastructure is to us at scale. Are your compute nodes all just Linux workloads then? Yes, we're on, only doing Linux workloads. Okay. Certain distributions that you need to be running? Or? We have qualified distributions. Um, we have qualified distributions, and we have, we have qualified hardware, but th that list is driven by customer partner requirements. So as the uh, Dell EMC Cisco folks start to release new pieces, uh, how fast do you qualify that? In I, I, we were just I, at Cisco yesterday, for example, and they came out with a new line of you know their server pieces. So, when when will DriveScale work with some of that, for example? So the servers themselves are so highly commoditized, and we install into Linux in very standard ways that we don't really feel a need to qualify the servers. We do qualify the storage targets, the JBODs and the flash arrays, and uh, and then we're careful not to do anything 
fancy with the network so we don't, we don't have to worry about switches. Okay. And by the way, when you look at, um, if you look at some of these um, ISVs application vendors, just to end, um, they're, they're basically deploying on bare metal hardware, commodity hardware. They are testing many of them, especially when their performance uh, requirements around SSDs. Um, SSDs have been evolving rapidly. And uh, so if you, if you, I, I encourage you to look at the Aerospike website at their uh, ACT testing and their SSD qualifications um, because we're getting to know a lot about that. And um, that, that uh, so it's commodity hardware. People are testing on an as-needed basis to deploy with what's current or emerging um, and being deployed. If it's not being deployed, we're not wildly testing things that nobody's using. <laughs>